Hello friends, and welcome to my new video, in which I'll tell you some new amazing stories. But before we begin, please subscribe to my channel and hit the like button on this video. Also, don't forget to write your thoughts about these stories in the comments. Let's get started. The first story is, you have a lower salary than me? You are not my equal. Backstory. I work in college dorms in a sort of generic first response role. We do a little bit of everything mainly security, but also medical, fire, and psych. These residences, which are located a few miles from the main campus, resemble a gated community. All of the workers are headquartered in a hub at the peak of this settlement. In addition to being used as a venue for events, it contains amenities for the students, catering, a gym, things like that, as well as a few conference spaces in the staff area for any college department may reserve if they so choose. There are also disabled parking spaces located between the staff parking spaces and the back doors. The staff parking spaces were all occupied one day as I arrived for my 10-hour night shift, which is practically never the case. But I figured out what was going on because I knew the HR department had a significant event there that afternoon in the meeting space that I talked about before. Well, they are college employees, it's not technically against the parking policy, but typically employees who don't actually work in the facility are expected to park in the visitor parking spaces rather than the staff parking. I was in trouble then. Ten minutes remained till the beginning of my shift, but I'm not permitted to utilize the student parking lots. What about the parking for guests? That will be secured overnight until my shift ends. If I parked there, I would have to go unlock the visitor parking in the morning, return the key, and then depart. One of my day shift co-workers would then have to go lock it back up after me. The only other choice I had was to park down the hill, but by the time I got there and went back up, I would already be running behind schedule and was going to miss the handover. That direction is clear. For the record, I would never typically park in a disabled bay. In general, it's a terrible, dirty thing to do. Even though I actually have a disability, it doesn't qualify me for disabled parking. There are a few things to keep in mind, though. The back door has key card access only, and there is no bell, so it is of little use to students or members of the public unless they have made a prior arrangement to be let in by someone. Nobody ever uses those bays unless we have a disabled person coming in for an event. There were no events planned for that evening, so the likelihood of three disabled people unexpectedly choosing to park towards the back of the hub, which is far away from literally anything else, is extremely low. There are only three bays total. Also, there's about the same amount of traffic there at night as there is on Route 50, so they could simply park next to it on the side of the road. I made the decision to park in the disability space that is furthest from the entrance and nearest to the staff spots. I get to take breaks frequently as long as they don't interfere with anything because of the lengthy and isolating hours that I work. If, in the improbable event, that more than two disabled individuals had requested to park and access the building, which I would learn about during the handover, I would simply stop working immediately, drive my car down the hill, and then climb my way back up. I enter, receive the handover, and as anticipated, nobody is supposed to enter. I set up my coworkers for the shift, logged on, set up the cameras how I wanted them, read my emails, turned on the radio, etc. Because I was the supervisor for that shift, our shift patterns rotate, and the longest in service is to be the supervisor. After some time, I convince one of the guys, Phil, to hide the cameras so I can go and inform a resident that he will face consequences for vandalism. Then, just as someone was going to knock on the office door, I have one of those classic sitcom moments and open the door. I recognize her right away. Let's call her Karen. She is the Dean of Facilities. We are currently operating outside of the facilities section, by the way. We're in the section for auxiliary services, so in no way, shape, or form is this woman my employer. She is, however, significantly more senior than I am, so I find myself in the awkward situation of having to submit to her unless I have a compelling reason not to, in which case I risk being reported to HR for disobedience, especially given that the building we're in is technically run by the facility section. More context. Karen is a classic power trip little b who is one of the most despised individuals among low-level workers throughout the entirety of the campus. Every time she talks down to someone earning less than her, which is all the time, you can almost see the unhealthy enjoyment in her eyes. In her many years with the institution, she has pulled no end of plain wicked crap. Thus, a startled Karen almost shoves me back into the office. 
She was one of the individuals parked in the staff spaces out back, and it turned out that she was attending whatever event the HR department was hosting inside the building that afternoon. She doesn't actually have an office in the building, therefore she should typically park in the guest spaces, although, as I said, that isn't legally against the policy. She recognized me because of the countless, always negative, conversations we've had in the past, and because she could see my name on the staff sticker on my windshield as she made her way back to her car. However, she noticed my car parked in the disabled bay. Where did you get the idea, OP, that you could park in the disabled bay? But nobody uses those, I say. Oh, what, do you really believe just because you are the one who enforces the rules that you are above them? Hey, it's no big problem. I'll go relocate the car right now. Oh, no, you don't. Not on college time. I'll move it on my break. No, the rest is the goal of breaks. Relaxation is not driving a car. So, what do you want me to do? I want you to fine yourself the usual $70. Are you serious? Sure. You must realize that you do not set the rules. You just put them into action. <laughs> I'm sorry, but this dialogue alone is enough to make you realize what a B Karen is. A break is just for relaxation. Whatever that's supposed to mean. A break is just time off from work. Workers can do whatever they want. Or am I wrong? Please let me know in the comments what you think. Let's continue. I now find myself just staring at her in awe. Even at my most temperate, I truly want to scream bloody murder at her, but... I cherish my job too much to let my ego get in the way of getting myself a ticket. The authority behind these tickets is the city, not the institution, as further context demonstrates. We are effectively subcontracted by the city to handle the parking and traffic enforcement for all roadways and parking on college property. I go restock the staff kitchen, then talk to the kid, and then I head back to the office because I know that if I talk to that vandal student right now, I'll just let off steam at that kid unfairly, and it wasn't going to be a pleasant talking to to begin with. I also know that sitting and staring at the cameras would just make me seethe. Remember that Phil, my friend who I had in front of the cameras, saw everything that had happened. Is that bee still here? I ask. He motions to one of the cameras and adds, She's just on her way out now, before adding, Oh, that's weird, she's leaving through the front. After work, Karen frequently visits the facility to use the gym, which is open to both staff and students free of charge. Given that she embarrassed me about an hour ago, it seems likely that she was doing the same thing today. When she does that, she takes a cab home because she lives at the other end of the city and traffic is terrible at this time of the evening. We can all agree that being stopped in traffic is a million times less miserable if someone else is the one driving. The following morning, she rides a cab back in to retrieve her car and head to the main campus. I pick up the parking regulations and skim through it when I have a lovely realization. There it is, in mouth-watering, bold font. Staff personnel are not allowed to leave their vehicle in staff parking spaces overnight or during non-working hours. Then it goes on to enumerate a few exclusions, none of which apply to Karen, mostly about breaks and other things. So, just as I start to write a ticket, I have another, even better thought. Well, we have some really cool cameras. Since we only have three entry and exit roads, and all of the cameras that monitor the roads were converted to plate recognition cameras by the city about six years ago, we now have the plate log in addition to the 40 days of saved camera footage. Since we only have three entry and exit roads, we can use the plate log to determine when a car entered the compound and when a car left. I lay out my strategy for Phil. He has no qualms about doing me a favor and taking the time to check the plate log system to determine how frequently Karen has left her car parked here overnight. He has all the dates together after about four hours. Karen has left her car unattended for the night 585, yeah, 585 times in the past four years and whatever many months, weeks, and days since the plate system went online. I then sign into the Fine Portal application of the city. Well, in fact, that is what it's called. You can only issue tickets for ongoing and momentary offenses. If you discover something after the fact using auxiliary systems like cameras or other devices, you must mail out a fine. I type in her office address and begin entering each of the 585 dates and times, copying and pasting a reference to the precise section of the parking code and the local ordinance that gives this policy legal power. The end result is a beautiful masterpiece work of art that costs $40,950, spans across 13 pages, and is simply 
beautiful. All the guys had returned to the office at this point, so I invite them over knowing that they will all enjoy it almost as much as I do. When I click, I receive a message that I've never seen before after clicking log and print. The fine you're about to impose exceeds $10,000. Are you certain you want to move it forward? Everyone is speechless. I'm the first to laugh, followed by Phil, and then everyone else. It was glorifying. I print it, place it in a windowed, prepaid city envelope, and mail it outside. The city forbids us from handing delivering fines or using the internal mail. I assume this is due to paper trail concerns. The icing on the cake is that since she was obviously also present that night, I also get to write her a ticket manually and put it under her windshield. Naturally, when I return to work the following day after she receives this, she's waiting for me inside the office. OP, what the heck? Do you honestly think that this is going to work? What do you mean? Answer. The fines. F you. Really, do you think this is going to work? Karen, the rules are rules. You know that this has never actually been done here as well as I do. I don't set the rules, Karen, that's for sure. Simply put, I enforce them. Karen exits to the right. There is more to this now, some of it nice and some of it bad. I'll begin with the negative. Karen ultimately filed a lawsuit, so I had to be in court on my day off. The good news is that since I was ostensibly there on behalf of the city and had the municipal council, I wasn't being sued personally. The court ultimately reduced the fine to $10,000, which was reportedly the city's maximum amount for post-facto fines imposed at one time. I assume that's why the warning was there. Karen had sued to have the fine completely dismissed, so it was still sort of a triumph. She also attempted to bring it up with HR, but since the Dean of Auxiliary Services despises her as well, he defended me in HR, so that didn't quite work out for her either. But what's the best thing? I was chosen to serve on the Auxiliary Services Policy Review Board this year. I was successful in changing the parking policy last week. It now states that staff members must use guest parking whenever they visit a building other than their office, unless they are instructing a class. If there are fewer than 20 staff parking spaces available at the building and vacant visitor spaces. As a result, beginning in June, Karen will not be permitted to park in any of the staff places. Strangely, it turns out that I now do set the regulations. I think we have one thing that the evil Karen was right about. You probably shouldn't have parked in those spots, even if you almost have the right to do so. From my own experience, people often park in such places for a minute, then someone else does it, and then everyone starts doing it. That's called herd behavior. The worst thing about this is that someday, there will definitely be a situation when a person who really needs it and has the right to do so will not be able to park their car there because they don't have the ability to do so and you have taken their rightful place. In general, the OP did a great job, though. The next story is HOA installed hidden camera. My bungalow is located on the edge of a neighborhood dominated by a community association. I am against this association, so I did not become a part of it. If you're wondering why I'm against this community, my answer is simple. When this HOA was first created, the first members elected a person with whom I had a bad relationship as its boss. So, if I were part of the HOA, I would receive some bad actions from it against me, surely. Also, the concept of an HOA is not very close to me. I think you understand perfectly well that it often happens that the HOA just chooses to despise you. It was a Sunday. The laziest Sunday possible. I drank coffee, watched my favorite programs on TV, read some books from an ebook. Somewhere around the beginning of the second half of the day, I decided that I couldn't continue to rest. I decided to wash the windows, because unfortunately I don't do that very often, because the structure of my house makes it not very easy to do. And while cleaning my bedroom window, I noticed a green light on my tree. It was a very small but very bright speck which in some positions of my head could shine very disgustingly in my eyes. Of course, I was interested in this little flashlight. At first, I ran to get my binoculars that my father had given me many years ago. Unfortunately, I hadn't used them for a very long time, so there was some problem with the lenses and I couldn't use them properly. Then I decided to use a regular camera from my phone and the zoom function. I still couldn't see exactly what it was, 
So I finally decided to go outside, get a ladder from the garage, and climb this tree. I really didn't want to do it because it was hard, but my curiosity won out. When I climbed up the tree and saw where this green flashlight was shining from, my heart dropped to my heels. It turned out to be a surveillance camera that was facing directly at my bedroom window. I was surprised that it wasn't even an IP camera, so I started immediately following the wire of this camera to see where it was connected, and I was shocked to see that this wire was leading to the private property of the local HOA boss. I started filming everything I saw with my smartphone camera. When I had filmed everything, I started knocking on the door of this boss to hear his excuses, and he stated that it was not what I thought it was. He said that it was a new secret secure system from the HOA. He is a BA hole. What security system? Why does this CCTV system only cover my bedroom window? How do I know what this camera is filming? I'm still a little embarrassed to write this, but now this a hole is still in jail. He was sentenced to four years in prison and also had to pay me $230,000. I was lucky to have a lawyer who saw this case through. Have a lawyer on speed dial and also keep an eye out for anything unusual on your private property. Now my terrible landlord's house is condemned by the city authorities. During my time in college, I've lived in a number of different terrible locations, but this one was by far one of the worst. Recently, two other girls and I had all moved into the same house. Although it wasn't the nicest house, it appeared to be adequate for a student flat. The landlord was a bit of an a-hole, but generally meant well, and the rent was a reasonable price, according to a girl who had a friend who had previously lived there. I'll call him dumb landlord from now on. We all opted to sign a lease because we were broke. When dumb landlord wanted to sign it in a big boy's after he had just finished supper there and the leasing agreement looked like it had been pieced together from other lease agreement images on Google, those were red flags that should have been obvious to me. But we also discovered this apartment through a Craigslist advertisement. For a few months, everything ran smoothly. I was living alone until the start of the following school year, but... I wasn't always at home because I frequently visited and slept at my boyfriend's place. Our home was on the first level and had another unit in the basement. It didn't take me long to start noticing things were happening. Since we were in the Midwest, near several large nearby lakes and it was spring, we would receive a significant amount of rain. The concrete steps leading up to the house would frequently fill with water that I had to jump over when we would receive a big amount of rain and then it would all dissipate overnight. In addition, the house began to have a mild, musty odor, and I began to constantly sneeze and cough for no apparent reason. Soon after, the other girls moved in, and that's where our problems with the dumb landlord began. He refused to let us know when he would visit the property to check on it. He said he did this to keep up on looks and mow the lawn, but he did it way too often for any of us to be okay with. In regards to having a copy of our own lease, he would dispute that with us. He would holler at us to give him cash for the rent, especially before he and his girlfriend left for the cabin in the north. The major issue was that he didn't care that we were suffering mold issues. We hadn't spoken to the residents in the downstairs apartment for some time, but that changed once dumb landlords started causing difficulties for everyone. Just about as frequently as we heard them yelling and fighting below as we did upstairs. But they were in a pit of torment. On everything they possessed, mold was present. Wherever you looked, there were bugs, earwigs, beetles, ants, you name it. They frequently had to throw away their belongings, including clothes, dishes, furniture, academic papers, schoolwork, since everything was growing mold. To store the majority of their valuable stuff, they spent money on plastic bins, but even those were starting to rot. After signing a leasing agreement, we'd also learned that they were intended to share a room with someone else, but... She was unable to do so due to mold allergies. We also learned that she and her mother were verbally tortured by a dumb landlord over the phone to the point of tears and that she was unable to break the lease. He refused to let her break their contract and didn't care, so she ended up paying for two apartments each month so she could avoid living there. 
Although it wasn't as horrible as the basement, the upstairs, frankly, wasn't much better. Every month, we all coughed more and more. We began to get terribly ill and would frequently wake up in the middle of the night in a coughing fit. We did our best to air out the house, but it really didn't do any good. I ultimately had a terrible case of strep throat, which was so painful that every swallow made my eyes water and caused me to speak loudly. I attempted to ask the doctor I saw if he could subsequently demonstrate that this was caused by mold, but he was unable to provide me with a firm response. I tried to describe what was happening in the house to him because I was a talkative, good neutral person that was also enrolled in school to become an architect. He had no ventilation, concrete steps, and unsealed foundation walls, so all the water I'd have to jump over most likely went into the basement walls and caused the majority of the mold. In addition, we discovered a few spots on the roof that needed patching, since, among other things, we discovered some leaks. With there only being one method of entry and escape, the basement apartment's cheap patio doors would frequently be in contact with water during heavy downpours. Well, because dumb landlord thought that we were all just chicks moaning about insignificant things, he dismissed us and said that we were okay, despite the fact that I had told him that I was studying these topics in school and I knew what I was talking about. Despite our best efforts, he wouldn't allow us to break the lease. The girls in both apartments then made the decision that, if it came to it, we would all simply leave. So I started looking up all the pertinent legal facts about apartments and tenants in our state and city so that I could figure out how to leave. We started paying the attorney's fees, began collecting whatever images of the mold we could locate upstairs and downstairs, spoke with numerous police officers and city staff members, and began assembling this information into a professional document. After delaying my rent payment so I could obtain a copy of the lease agreement from Dumb Landlord, we were able to see our legal document and proceed to leave after doing so. We were also collaborating with another landlord, who I'll call Good Landlord, at a local rental agency. Thankfully, he was making every effort to get us into his apartment and out of that crapshoot. He would provide us with information on the rental industry's legal nitty-gritty and assist us in identifying a loophole. Then, after countless months of debates, expenditures, and investigation, we found it. We could leave if a mold test was sent to a research facility and the results showed that the area was more than it was allowed to be safe in. We could safely declare that we were fairly certain it was beyond the limit. A few days later, the results of the tests were received and we forwarded them to the city together with our attractive package of images, financial accounts, and lease agreements. In less than four hours, we received a call from the city. Our home had so much mold in it that we had to vacate the unit within a day or it would be condemned. We were thrilled. Even though it was distressing to learn that the mold count was that high, all of that effort had finally paid off. The mold researcher, who had been in the business for more than 30 years, had never before encountered a site with a higher mold level than this property. Yeah, black mold was included here. Imagine us gleefully packing up our home, our parents removing us all at once, moving into another apartment that good landlord made available for us, and our poor, elderly, dumb landlord sobbing in our driveway as we joyfully load our boxes into our cars. He should have paid more attention and listened to us, his girlfriend's property, and she's going to dump him, they complain, adding that. The following day, we all posed for a picture while grinning in front of the condemned signs. That continues to be one of my favorite photos ever. He deserves it for not paying attention to his tenants. Update. When we spoke to the city about the fallout, it sounded as though they were aware of a lot of his dubious activities and that he was quite the eye-roll landlord. They were all aware of additional issues he had had with tenants, but until us, nobody had been able to actually take any action against him. Since that it was a very tiny town, he would sneak his way out of situations. We had a pretty hard time getting out of there since, sadly, there weren't many restrictions established in place for terrible landlords unless they did something really unlawful. A year or so later, I noticed that there was once again college students residing there. To get it back on the market, he probably used one of those at-home mold testing kits or engaged in some sort of conflict with the city. A lot of carpet was torn out, but I'm not sure what he actually renovated. I felt sorry for those newcomers either way. I merely wished them well and hoped that they wouldn't have the same negative experience that we had. 
I wish the outcome had been different, but I hope he learned his lesson and will now genuinely assist his renters when they are in need. Although, I don't dislike him per se. I believe he needs to sort out a few things for himself. Is this landlord really that stupid, or is he just pretending? Does he have at least a 25% idea of just how dangerous mold can be? In my opinion, the OP should have filed a lawsuit against such a landlord whose actions, or rather inaction, have a bad effect on multiple other people. This is no joking matter. First of all, mold is a very serious issue. Secondly, if you ignore it for a long time, it grows to such a size that it's extremely difficult to remove. It's very difficult to destroy even small areas, but if it becomes non-local, then you cannot do it without a group of professionals. Honestly, from my own experience, it's sometimes difficult to eliminate even a small area without professionals. Do you know any effective methods from your own experience? Tell us about it in the comments. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder, subscribe, like, and comment. See you soon.